Okay, guys, so now we're going to talk about high flow oxygen devices. So again, I just uh, put this PowerPoint slide in here to really uh, reaffirm the definition of what makes something high flow. And a high flow device is a device that has enough flow that it is always um, exceeding the patient's inspiratory flow rate. Okay, and I have um, practice for you guys on Blackboard when it opens up that will allow you to um, kind of better see examples of this. So when a device flow exceeds your patient's inspiratory demand, it becomes a fixed performance device, which means it can deliver a specific FiO2 that you should be able to measure. The FiO2 itself may be low or high. High flow does not necessarily equate to high concentration. And the FiO2 will be precise. No room air is going to be entrained by the patient. Only the device itself will entrain room air. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that means as we kind of move through the devices. So if you're trying to estimate um, your patient's inspiratory demand or your inspiratory flow of your patient, it's going to circle back to your guys' favorite calculation, uh, the minute ventilation calculation, where you're going to take their respiratory rate and you're going to times it by their tidal volume. Um, for this one, 14 times 425, you end up with 5,950 milliliters or 5.95 liters for their minute ventilation. You're going to take um, their minute ventilation 5.95 times 3, okay? So that gives you 17.85 liters, and that's the inspiratory flow demand of that particular patient, okay? So that gives you one component of information that you're going to need for your O2 device selection, and that gives you your patient's inspiratory flow needs, okay, which is 17.85. The total device flow must meet the patient's peak inspiratory flow needs. Um, just saying the same thing here. You want to make sure that that device, if it's going to be high flow, is covering your patient's inspiratory flow needs. So the way that we find that, again, is calculating three times the minute ventilation. If you cannot figure out the minute minute ventilation, um, we use 60 liters as our default number. And the reason that we do that is because 20 liters per minute is close to the upper limit of anybody's sustainable spontaneous minute volume. So if for some reason your patient has like chain stokes breathing or irregular breathing pattern, or you have no idea what their actual minute ventilation is, you can use 60 liters and that's for sure going to cover their inspiratory flow needs. And then that will ensure that your device is a high flow device. So um, there's a, a mini clinic on Egan, page 921 that I'm going to refer to here where this patient is on a 40% air entrainment nebulizer, which you guys are going to learn about more later. The flow meter from the wall is set at 12. The tidal volume for this patient is 600 and the respiratory rate is 33. So what is the patient's inspiratory flow? right? So if you're figuring that out, you're going to take your 600 times your 33. You end up with 19.8 liters. So that gives you your minute ventilation. You're then going to take that 19.8 liters and you're going to multiply it by three because that's our guesstimate tool. And that puts you at 59.4 liters for that patient's inspiratory flow. So again, these are some of the indications of um, where you would have to use that 60 liters per minute or where you would want high flow in general. So if your patient has a regular respiratory pattern, this is a situation where you're probably not going to be able to estimate their needs. Um, their tidal volume is irregular, so you could use 60 liters to cover that patient and make sure that they are, in fact, on high flow. If your patient has a respiratory rate that is greater or equal to 25, um, I should change that greater or equal to 25. Um, that is a situation where your patient is going to need a high flow device. And we'll talk about the different high flow devices that you have. If you have a tidal volume that's irregular, either too small or too large, you're going to be looking at a high flow device. The other big one that you guys just have to commit to memory and just know is if ever in the patient case scenario, it says anything about CO2 retainer or just COPD in general, they are going to want you to put that patient on a high flow device. And the reason why is they're going to want a fixed FiO2. 
And the reason that they're going to think that that is important is because of the O2 hazard we know is associated with people who are chronic retainers, and that is the O2 hazard of depression of ventilation. So this is a patient population that your boards is going to want you to know is high risk, and they're going to want them to be on a high flow device so that they have that fixed FiO2 and can be monitored closely that way. I am going to tell you, um, in clinical practice at both hospitals, you're not going to see that happen. But for your boards, that is absolutely 100% the way that that's going to be. Um, the other thing is if you have a newborn or premature infant, they're also going to want it on a high flow device. And again, this is because of the O2 hazard of retinopathy of prematurity and just really the importance of having a, a fixed FiO2 um, for a newborn or premature infant. Okay, high flow devices. So I'm going to kind of whiz through some of these explanations. I don't want you guys to get too worried about it um, because I have a whole other tab on Blackboard that kind of goes through um, these explanations as well. And then this is going to be what we're essentially doing in class during what would be our lecture time. It's just kind of difficult to explain this um, without you guys seeing the devices. So I'm going to try to kind of find a good balance here. So for high flow devices, you have what are called air entrainment systems, or they'll call them um, Venturi masks. And the two that we're going to be looking at are the air entrainment mask, specifically the venti mask, or the air entrainment nebulizer, specifically the large volume jet neb. Um, they have different interfaces, aerosol masks, trait cradles, T pieces. You guys are going to see all that in lab. But... Um, that is a version of high flow, these Venturi systems or air entrainment systems. You also are going to be looking at what's called a blending system. And that is um, our blender, uh, oxygen O2 blender, or um, in Mayo's case, because they only have the one source gas, it's an uh, oxygen blender that entrains its own room air. We'll talk more about that later. But you have a flow meter that goes generally all the way up to 75, sometimes higher. And then you also have a proportioner that you can set from all the way down from 21% up to 100%. Um, Mayo's, I think the lowest it goes is 24 just because they have that single gas source. But again, high flow does not necessarily mean high concentration. Um, they have a lot of different interfaces as well, high flow nasal cannulas, masks, trachs, et cetera. We'll see those in lab. So this whole slide, I used to be a big proponent of really understanding the Bernoulli principle. And I am making the very spontaneous decision that this is a slide you guys do not need to spend a lot of time on. Um, what I want you guys to know is that the Bernoulli principle is associated with air entrainment systems, okay? We'll explain the math behind it. We'll explain some of the principles behind it. But I think spending your time learning the Bernoulli principle is not a good usage of your time. So this slide, I'm going to tell you right now, you can skip over. Um, here we go. Leave it to me to click the link during our recording. Of course, I would do that. Okay. So air entrainment, uh, we are going to end up looking at two components of air entrainment. Um, we're going to be looking at the size of the jet orifice, which again, you guys are going to see these in labs, and the size of the air entrainment ports. All right. Um, I'm going to kind of breeze through this right now because without hands-on, that's not the best um, thing to kind of discuss on the PowerPoint. But big thing with these air entrainment masks or systems is that your FiO2 is determined by an air to oxygen mixture. It's a ratio that we are going to solve for. And this is where that Bernoulli principle kind of circles back and is applied. So um, the FiO2 does not necessarily change with the leader flow. And you guys are going to kind of see an example of that more with lab. Um, this is talking about the other air entrainment system, which is the large volume jet nebs. We're going to kind of skip that for right now because it's going to be for lab. So if you're trying to calculate the total flow of device, 
Early in this PowerPoint, we looked at the patient inspiratory flow, and we talked about how that's the minute ventilation times three. So that's one portion of a patient case scenario is knowing what your patient's inspiratory flow needs. The second portion is if you're if you're picking an O2 device and you pick one of these Venturi systems, so you have your venti mask your oxy mask, and your large volume jet nib. Again, we're gonna really classify those in lab, so don't worry too much that those aren't um, the clearest to you now. Um, you also then have to figure out the total flow that that device is giving, okay? And the reason we have to figure that out is we wanna make sure that we're meeting the patient's inspiratory flow needs to make sure that it is, in fact, a high flow device. So, this is the more complicated way that you figure out um, the O2 to air ratio. What kind of has been adopted over the years is this thing called um, the magic box, which I did not name it, so don't hold me accountable for that. Um, but what they do is they take room air, which they round down to 20 just for the ease of math, and then they take 100% and they put them in here. In the middle, you have your desired or set FiO2, right? So that's going to be the middle number. You will take, it'll probably be easier to see on this one because they used 40% as an example. 100 minus 40 equals 60. 20 minus 40 equals 20. I realize that that's a negative, but we don't use the negative. We just treat them as whole numbers. And then the ratio becomes the 60 divided by 20, okay? The numerator is always the value for air. The denominator is always the value for O2. Um, you're always gonna express your O2 as one. So in the ratio, this is always gonna be your oxygen. This is always gonna be your air. So in the case of 40% oxygen, you have a three to one ratio. And what this means is for every one part oxygen, there are three parts room air being entrained by the Venturi system, okay? So one part oxygen, three parts room air. This is gonna be fed by the oxygen flow meter. This is gonna be brought in from the room by the device. And that's where that air entrainment window and that jet orifice comes into play, which we can talk about when you guys can actually get hands on. Um, but that's what that ratio is. So how you figure out the total flow of your device is you take your air entrainment ratio, which for 40%, we figured out was three to one. You take the sum of that ratio or three plus one, which equals four. You then take that four and you multiply by whatever you have the flow meter set at. So if you can imagine, which I know is kind of tricky, that you have, let's say, a venti mask and it's attached to a flow meter to the wall and that flow meter is set at 10 and the venti mask is set at 40%. You would take this four and you would multiply it by the 10 liters that is set on that flow meter and you're gonna get 40. And that is the total flow from that device. So if you took that oxygen flow meter and you turn it up to 12, then what you would do is take that four and you would multiply it by 12 instead and that would give you 48 liters for your total um, device flow. If I'm losing you guys right now, um, please don't panic. I have, again, a whole other tab where I break this down and try to explain it. And this is going to be a large focus of the discussion that we have in our face-to-face -face, um, time. So um, when we look back at that mini clinic that we did before where we figured out the patient's inspiratory flow needs were 59.4% and they were on a 40% air entrainment neb or large volume jet neb, kind of same thing. I'm just showing you both abbreviations at 12 liters, right? We know that 40% is a three to one ratio. So the sum of that is four. And then we multiply the four by the 12. So that means that we're looking at a total device output of 48 liters per minute, okay? That is not enough to meet this patient's inspiratory flow needs. This patient is requiring almost 60 liters per minute. This device at 40% and 12 liters is only providing 48 liters per minute. So that means that this is not operating as a high flow device. Even though it is one of our high flow devices on the grid, for this patient, the patient's inspiratory flow needs are greater than what this device can provide. And that's kind of what's gonna be happening in your patient case scenarios. 
So again, if you're looking at an air and treatment ratio for 40% venting mass, three to one, an oxygen flow meter is set at 10 liters, the total device flow is 40 liters. If a patient's tidal volume is 400 and their respiratory rate is 20, what is their minute ventilation, okay? So circling back, you take that 400 times the respiratory rate of 20, and you get eight liters, okay? So that's their minute ventilation. If you wanna figure out if this 40% venti mask set at 10 liters is a high flow device, you would have to take their minute ventilation of eight, multiply it by three, which will get you 24. So 24 is your patient's inspiratory flow needs. And you know that the total device flow is 40, which means for this patient with their current inspiratory flow needs, this is a high flow device because they are meeting and exceeding the patient's inspiratory flow needs. And so that's how we're gonna utilize this kind of math practice. So for this one, if you were gonna calculate the air entrainment ratio for a 60% venti mask, okay, um, you're gonna do that magic box again. And what I probably am gonna do as I'm talking through this and realizing it is post a key for this because this would have been normally done on the board in class and I'm just talking into a headset all crazy-like, expecting you to follow it. But um, how about for slide 21, just know that I'll post a, a key where I take you through this step by step. And it's my bad for not catching this before I started this long rambly discussion. So slide 21 on this PowerPoint will have a key. Moving on, we're going to talk about blenders. So we have oxygen blenders. There's two that you guys are going to look at. Um, you're gonna look at the one that's very similar to what Gunderson has that has an air and oxygen source for gas. Uh, it has an audible alarm if um, either gas pressure fails. So I don't know if you have had a chance to plug them in. If not, it's no big deal. But if you plug in the oxygen and you haven't plugged in the room air yet, it makes a very high pitch whine. And the reason it's doing that is it's letting you know that there's a five PSI difference between the connection of the oxygen and the room air. It wants both to be plugged in before it'll stop making that alarm. Uh, the other blender that we're gonna look at has just one um, gas source and it's oxygen. And that's very similar to the Mayo blender. So what that actually uses is the device itself has a Venturi system that draws in room air from the surrounding environment, and it is able to proportion its FiO2 that way. The only big difference between them is ours can go down to 21%. Theirs, I think, can only go down to 24%. So not a huge difference there. Um, generally, for blenders, the proportioner mixes gases um, all the way from 21 to 100% approximately, obviously with some caveats there. But it, just know that because it has the uh, separate uh, flow meter that can go above 60 liters per minute, it's always going to be considered a high flow device. So if you do have a patient that has a very high inspiratory flow need, this is kind of your go-to because it's for sure going to cover them. They're for sure going to get that precise FiO2 that you are setting. Um, again, if you don't know the minute ventilation, you start at 60. This is gonna talk really quickly about some of the interfaces. The one that I really wanna draw your attention to is for a high flow nasal cannula for adults, they don't recommend that you go above 50 liters per minute. It's just really intense to have something in your nose above 50 liters per minute. In practice, generally we don't even hit that. And the reason I wanna draw your attention to that is because if you were on a blender system and you had a patient with very high patient inspiratory flow needs, probably the high flow nasal cannula is not an interface that you would choose given that you don't wanna go above the 50 liters per minute. Um, it, blenders are commonly used um, for infants. The range for infants is obviously much lower. It's around one to eight. Um, one thing that makes high flow nasal cannulas very effective is they have large prongs that fill up the entire nares. Because of that, they create a little bit of CPAP. Um, that positive pressure can kind of help with that oxygenation. Because it's a high flow system that essentially will 
bypass the upper airway, it does need to be heated and humidified. We're not going to talk about humidification in this module very much, but just know that that is kind of the truth of um, this device. It always has to be heated and humidified. Um, and then again, when you're using a blender, you always have a precise FiO2. Uh, your next interface is going to be our high concentration aerosol mask. This is one that you can use on the high flows. So this is one that you could set at 60, no problem. Um, if you are starting to get anywhere around 60, just to maintain oxygenation or above 60, this is a time that you're going to be thinking this patient probably needs more intervention. So anytime I start to get close to the max out settings on a blender, um, hundred percent and high flows, I start to think CPAP, BiPAP intubation. So even though you can do something, doesn't always mean that that's the best idea. Um, if you're getting close to maxing out your settings, you'd probably want to be seeking out a different therapy. The other interface that we're going to talk about and you guys are going to see is a trach cradle. Um, this is what we use with um, our trachs to keep them heated and humidified and um, on oxygen if they need oxygen. Otherwise, we can just set them at room air and just give them the heat and humidity through the trach cradle. There's also T pieces, um, which you guys will see in lab. Um, again, if you have a trach cradle or a T-piece, it means the upper airway is bypassed, which means it must be heated and humidified. And then just a little note here, all ventilators have internal blenders to create a precise FiO2. It's a proportioner that um, makes a very specific FiO2 for that. Um, okay, so I think I will end up going through some of the tab on Blackboard where you guys have all of the high flow patient inspiratory flow explanations. I know that was kind of a quick spiel, but just know that there is more detailed explanations available for you guys on Blackboard that you can kind of um, muddle through and then we are going to be talking about it during the face to face.